I have the impression that you, you didn't have too many choices, some of you. So, um, anyway, it should be a fun class. Um, huh? For everybody. Um, one thing that, I mean, <coughs> everybody knows a little bit of optimization, I mean, from the fields you're, you know, you're working on. And, um, and you know the optimization is everywhere, uh, especially for humankind. We try to optimize things. Um, so we'll, we'll go over a, a bunch of uh, techniques and theory and applications of these um, techniques of optimization. Um, we're meeting at kind of an odd time, so we're going to spend lunch together. I haven't figured out an optimal way to have the lunch, so uh, it's either before or after, uh, most likely after, right? Um, <clears throat> let's see, we should have a break, uh, at most 10 minutes break, so that's not gonna make it for lunch, but um, you know, um, feel free if you feel hungry, you brought something, you know, just. Um, use that time. Um, 10, 12, 15, is that a good time? Or 12, 12, 15? Um, we started a little bit late already. Um, let me um, um, read. Um, let's see, we'll be uh, videotaping these lectures, and um, I haven't yet made uh, a decision whether to make it public or just restrict it to the in-class students, so, but regardless of this, you'll, being registered in the class, you'll have access um, to this, um, to the lectures. Um, if you miss a class, you know, you can, a class being like a week, week long um, in a regular semester. Um, worth of material. So, uh, if you have to miss a class, you know you, you you're not gonna get behind. But um, you know, I mean, you know by now uh, how important it is to come to class and um, you know participate. We're just meeting for five weeks, so uh, today we have to kind of cover one week of material in our regular class. Uh, <coughs> Uh, make, um, I have to mention this. Uh, we're meeting the day before the Independence Day. Since Independence Day, I think it's on a Friday, so we're meeting Thursday, right before. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, and also the final exam 
will be on the 14th, so that's a Monday. So that's after, I mean, five weeks from today, basically. Um, I have the tentatively set of my office hours uh, Monday, Wednesday after this class and Friday before the class. Um, so you can see I arrange my weekend to be a little bit, maximize my weekend uh, time, but um, uh, that might change, so we'll, depending on, on everybody's schedule. Okay, so a little bit about the content. Um, I, at some point I'll ask you to fill out maybe a questionnaire so I know um, what, um, what brought you here, basically. I mean, I know some of you are math uh, majors, I mean, undergrad or grad. Um, some of you are engineering. Um, some of you are physics. Let's see. Anything that's not covered in these groups? Okay. Well, that's good. Um, but anyway, even in this within, there's a wide range of interests, and you um, probably have seen optimization problems in your field that are kind of you know different than others have seen. So um, I'd like to structure this course, have this kind of a, a topic a week. Uh, so of course, each of these topics would take a whole course, whole semester. Um, to go into the sort of the depths and all the details. Uh, so we're going to start talking about linear programming, which hopefully m m more of you are, are uh, I mean, you're more familiar with, um, such as the simplex method we're going to talk about today. Um, then we're going to talk a second week on nonlinear programming. Um, that is already, well, even the first topic is, is is actually a topic of current research. So there's um, there's lots of lots of ramifications. Uh, nonlinear programming even more. So there's fewer methods for nonlinear programming um, that there are for linear programming. So we're going to learn a few of these. Um, that approximation techniques. That's going to be. Um, a little bit of both the previous ones and and um, some techniques that you might encounter in uh, in other applications. The last two weeks, um, I plan to spend on um, what I call uh, what what what's known as variational calculus of variation and optimal control. Um, so, of course, all of this were I mean every every single topic will be more of an introduction to the topic than an exhaustive uh, treatment of the topic. Um, and the book does a very good job sort of uh, integrating all of this. Unfortunately, you have to leave out other things that, um, you know, as I said, it might be going into more details of linear programming or so. Um, there are books that maybe just cover the first two and so forth. Um, <coughs> all right. Any questions on this? Has anybody heard of any of the five, or it's all fresh to everybody? Oh. Hmm? I've heard of them. All of them? Yeah. Good. Um, anyway, so we're going to be learning about um, quite important you know, advanced techniques of optimization. Um, so I'm going to try to keep uh, more of the computational aspects, um, and I'll, I'll, be use Mat I'll be using MATLAB for that. Um, you don't have to go and uh, jump by the MATLAB. I mean, there's a nice server that actually is maintained by the College of Engineering that you, you can have access to uh, remotely. So I'll actually be using that because my tablet is, runs very slowly, so it's much faster if I run on the server. So we'll do that in a minute. But um, And either is any kind of experience MATLAB really required because um, I'll sort of give you the sample code. The homework, I'll assign um, not many, but some homework that can keep you um, busy from, from day to day. Uh, well, we're meeting every other day, so. Um, and um, the book has, I mean, I'll, I'll try to kind of stick to the book because 
the time constraints um, that we have. And um, let's see, anything else? Yeah, so I've set a midterm for June 27th, so that's an important date. Um, and the final on the, on, the, on the 14th of July. Okay? Are these in class exams? Yes, friends. Will it take the whole two hours? Or? Uh, I haven't decided. Midterm, sir, may, may not. Maybe just one half of it. But then you'd lecture the second half. Yeah. But um, final, I think it's going to be the whole, just. At least the whole class will be reserved for that, so. Um, okay. So, I'll, um, I mean, nothing will change here. I'll just change some of the typos here. But anyway, um, this is pretty much the syllabus for the class. Uh, there's some fine print that has to go there. Um, go back. Um, so I was talking about access to MATLAB. I think the easiest to go to uh, um, way to get it is um, going to this ES Lab online thing uh, called No Walls Remote Access. Um, they actually have running two separate servers. One is on a Windows Windows server, and one it's um, a Linux server. Um, pretty much, it's. I mean, they work uh, great both. Um, I don't know what kind of load is on each, but um, I think I'll be using the Windows since I have a tablet. Um, and also, I think the there's a, a slight advantage using the Windows in the current setup. Um, so let me ask, how many people have never? Seen MATLAB used or one, two, three, okay. Um, so I'll, I'll go through some of this uh, today, and I mean not 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 all, but um, at least just to get you started, so you can kind of explore on, on your own. So there are instructions for the Windows uh, platform for the Windows Server. We're connected to the Windows Server, and um, Let's see, maybe it was a mistake to open it because it's going to take some time. But um, following those instructions should um, tell you, uh, let's see, uh, the server that you, you should uh, remote connect and somewhere. But basically, you have to use your UFP. Um, Oh, here it is. Okay, of course. Um, rats one or rats two, so there are even two. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna remote there and stay connected. Uh, remote desktop connection. You know, connect. And that's all you have to do. Okay, so that's it, I think. Okay, and that's MATLAB. So uh, I think the first thing you open it, you're going to see actually like a, 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 a default layout, which has all kinds of windows and. Um, I mean, they're, they're used for each window, but um, usually just I close all of this unless I need it. Uh, close this. So, Oh, and actually to start it, you should click on the MATLAB icon. Stop me if there is any questions, because I'm going through this kind of fast. Um, and you're at the command line. You can actually type things. Um, the current... Windows Server doesn't allow symbolic uh, computations because of 64-bit compatibility or something. But um, I don't think we're going to use any of it in the class, so there's not a, uh, an issue with that. 
and you don't know if you don't know what symbolic uh, capability means, that doesn't even um, matter then. Um, okay, so let me um, let me let me minimize this for now, and we're going to come back to this. Um, so there are several. There's there's a, actually a 44 page kind of uh, comments on on it's actually first chapter in a book on MATLAB which is not this one uh, related to optimization and it's publicly available so that's actually great and um, I linked it here and I don't know again maybe okay um, I'll um, I can actually point to the exact book that that this first chapter is from but. Um, it's a it's a very sort of uh, instructive. I mean, it has some some sort of um, historical, you know, some um, commentaries about uh, comments about optimization. Um, some more examples that you know you might find interesting, and um, so I just found it to be sort of um, useful. I mean not only for optimization for the linear programming that we do and we're going to talk about this today more um, I'm just <coughs> going down to where they talk about MATLAB so um, yeah so, so there is a um, nice and uh, useful Um, well, installation issues there shouldn't be an issue. As I said, I think it's unless you're a very, uh, you know at home at a very bad connection, it's probably not um, not bad to use this uh, remote access, um, especially for optimization um, applications. There is so-called an optimization toolbox that's required, and it doesn't automatically come with the student versions of MATLAB. So if you if you already have student version of MATLAB, that's it. You won't have the optimization toolbox, so you won't be able to run those uh, commands that we need. Um, and anyway, it gives you kind of a quick introduction. So using MATLAB first time, blah blah blah. Um, gives you a few. So it's a, it's kind of a kind of a good introduction. In addition to that uh, connection to the um, optimization uh, topic, let's see. So we'll, we'll we'll kind of go through most of most of these things, um, hopefully during this first week. But so um, so you may want to print that, but you know. Just keep in mind it's kind of a big 44 pages. Okay, and I have a first code here that I'm going to talk about hopefully today and um, show you how that kind of uh, works. Okay, so I'm going to go back. Anything else? Uh, well, I think I should. We should just uh, get started. Um, if there are no other questions about kind of general structure of the class. Hmm. So I'll try to use this notes, uh, this tablet, so we can kind of have a, a copy of the, except now it's not. No questions? You just ready to roll, huh?
Okay. Um, so, um, yes, please. I think I got an email a few days ago that talked about uh, you, you're enrolled in a course that uh, has e companion or something. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, there is a, a where I'm going to keep this gray is the homework and exams, and there are, there aren't going to be many. But um, and also, if I decide to keep it kind of, if the archives are going to be, um, you know, uh, all restricted to in class students only for now, uh, this is where you sh we need to go. So thanks for bringing that up. Um, e companion. Um, if you've used it before and you have a password and you should know it, otherwise you're going to contact them. But if you've never used it, this is the Password, capital UCCS, and your student ID. Okay. Um, it's not really set up right now, so I mean you won't see much. But uh, <coughs> listen, as I'm going to have the grades, first first set of uh, homework, then I'm I'm going to um, use this. Okay, so as I said, the, the first week we're going to talk about linear programming. And linear programming is something that, you know, it's, it's a kind of a strange name, but you've seen it hopefully before in your uh, uh, courses. And it pretty much is is a um, subclass of, of what we call mathematical programming problems. Which talks about um, finding the values of um, of the unknown variables x1, xk, for instance, that maximize or minimize, in other words, optimize a certain function or functional, in this case it's a, it's, a, it's a function of those variables, usually we use x, uh, f, so this is going to be called the objective function, or the cost function, depending on um, what is the uh, significance, practical significance of that function, subject to certain constraints. And the constraints are possibly other functions of those variables, so some sort of relationship between those variables. Um, we sometimes use inequality constraints, sometimes use equality constraints, or equality. All right. Um, And there could be several constraints for the same um, objective. So it could be one through, we usually use M, number of constraints. Okay? So this is fairly, I mean, it's a very general kind of um, class of, of problems where the functions could be, you know, it could be any kind of shape, 
form you might imagine, and the constraints may, may be kind of, you know, um, any shape. Now, this is not the only type of problems that we're, you know, optimization problems that we're going to be talking. So that's one one class. I mean, the in the last two weeks we're going to be talking about. <coughs> Optimizations, uh, optimization problems where, for instance, um, the objective function is not a function, but it's it's a function of functions. We're going to talk, be calling it functionals. The state of the system, which in this case is just x1 through xk, is a continuous, is no longer discrete. And the constraints could have sort of integral terms. And um, so just to kind of clarify that this is not kind of the most general class of optimization problems. But it is fairly general. And um, let's sort of stick with this for now. For an example of, of this is to uh, say maximize the function of two variables where it, you take the product of the, of the two subject to um, One constraint, you know, x squared plus y squared equals one. Right? It's a, it's an opt it's 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 an optimization problem of these of the exact kind that we we've had before. We, we've listed here. It's a it's a f uh, function of the two variables subject to one constraint. I mean, what's the actual significance of this? Or how? Mm -hmm. This one is not going to be a linear pro programming problem, and um, for two reasons. One is that the func the function, the objective function, is not a linear function. So a linear function would only uh, have dependence on the on the decision variables or the state variables, sometimes called as x's in a linear fashion, meaning, what does it mean linear fashion? Why is that not linear, not a linear? Square terms. Products and square terms. You just need a constant multiplied by each variable, right? In other words, if the variable is, when, when, is, when is a dependence linear? When you have sort of a change in the variable implies a change in the objective function, and that's regardless of where the change happens, right? So you have this linear slope, sort of. I mean, you have the same, you have an, uh, you know, with respect to each variable. So in that case, it's not um, the case, because you can change the x1 and the x2 with the same values, but the product is changing differently depending on what the values of x is, x1 and x2 are. Also, the constraint is not linear. Okay, but nevertheless, it's it's a it's kind of a one problem that everybody sees in calculus one. Maximize a product when well, okay, I, I exaggerate a little bit. Um, for instance, in calculus one, you see uh, maximize a product when the sum is constant. Okay, here's not the sum, but it's it's the um, sum of the squares. Well, still, you can talk about kind of the, um, and notice this is an equality constraint. Okay? We could also talk about uh, inequality constraint. But um, equality constraint means <coughs> you're looking at the feasible, feasible solution, a feasible set of the x1 and x2. And, you know, in this case, it's just a circle. If you'd have an inequality constraint like less, less than or equal to, it would be a, a disk, right? If the inequality would be greater than or equal, it would be the outside of the disk. So the feasible set is sort of the collection of, of the all possible um, values of the variables, x1 through xk, in this case just two, that satisfy the given constraints. In this case, again, is, is the circle. Um, 
how do you do some, a problem like this? Of course, we use some uh, what's called a Lagrange multiplier method. And we're going to be talking about this, you know, um, next week when we talk about nonlinear, uh, up to nonlinear <coughs> programming. But in essence, what do you um, what do you look for? You look for kind of points in this feasible set where this function achieves its maximum, the product, right? Now, you don't really do it like exhaustively because you have infinitely many points, but you use what's um, sort of known as, as the Lagrange multiplier method, which says um, if I call this G, you do what's known as the gradient of the first function of the object of the objective function has to be parallel to the gradient of the constraint function and this you have two dimensional vectors when are they parallel when one is one is a multiple of the other and this multiple lambda it's an unknown in the problem so you've introduced an additional unknown called the lagrange multiplier right we're going to talk about this in more details. Um, but basically, we're going to have to solve this equation for um, x1, x2, and lambda. Okay. Now, this equation is a vector equation, so it has two components. Right? Remember, what's the gradient of f? It's sort of putting the, the derivatives of f with respect to each variable in one of the, each in the corresponding component. So, the gradient, uh, the, the partial of f with respect to x1 in this case is x2, right? The partial of f with respect to x2 is x1. I mean, it's just just a simple example. You take derivative. Everybody knows how to take partial derivatives. Same with G. The gradient has to be, I mean, uh, has to be computed. And it's 2x1 and 2x2. So the Lagrange multiplier method says basically set up. An equation uh, where the gradient of f and the gradient of g are parallel vectors. So one is a multiple of the other. So it's x2 is lambda times 2x1, and x1 is lambda times 2x2. You have two equations with three unknowns. Okay, you need. Most cases, I mean, this is a nonlinear system, but actually, yeah, it's a nonlinear system if you if you want, if you want. Um, but the general rule is you need as many as equ equ equation as unknowns to be able to solve that. <coughs> so you need a third equation, and the third equation would be. Does anybody remember? The original constraint. The original constraint is the third equation that. Uh, ties x1 and x2 in this case. So this that what I call g to be equal to in that case it was 1 so x1 squared plus x2 squared equals 1. Okay? And you go from here. You solve this. How it's a different, uh, you know, it's a whole 
a different sort of animal. Some, you know, for, for this kind of system is, hmm? for nonlinear system is, is not, there is no kind of set recipe. Okay? So you can kind of see that um, the fact that the, we don't deal with linear problems kind of generates problems. Right? So um, these simple cases are you know, doable by hand or you know, even using some sort of symbolic capability of some, some computer. But um, in optimization, you really want kind of methods that work for kind of large scale systems. Not just two variables, but 20 and so forth. So, um, nevertheless, it's a starting point. For nonlinear optimization problems, this is a starting point. Okay. So, <coughs> I think the answer, in, uh, you know, of this would, would be that um, you end up having sort of two points where you have a maximum. Right, I mean that's where the product of the two x one x two is maximum, and you have two points where there's minimum. So it's so you're going to have four solutions. Once you, when you solve that system, you're going to get four solutions. Okay, and let me postpone uh, the uh, kind of the significance of lambda. This is just x one and x two. There's for each for each point, there's going to be a lambda corresponding to to each point, right? So there's going to be four solutions of that system. Um, okay, so A, a, a subclass of that mathematical programming problems, which basically has an objective function and needs to be optimized subject to some constraints, yeah? is this uh, linear programming problem, so LPPs, where, simply put, is everything that's the, both the objective and the constraints are linear functions of the variables. So that's that's pretty much. Uh, it's a nice kind of restriction to. So we have a linear objective function, then we have linear constraints. F, and again. By linear, we mean that it, it, it appears as I think I use k, so x k. So it's a linear combination of x one through x k with some co coefficients c one c k, which will um, will give them a name in a second. And the linear constraints are g i of x one. X K R um, A one A I one X one plus A I K X K less than or equal than B I or greater or equal or greater than or equal to. So you could have constraints that are bigger and constraints that are smaller. Uh, excuse me, inequality is is less than bigger than, and some can be equality constraints. <coughs> so, so in short, this, this would say that the maximize, maximize or minimize um, We use vector notation. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this. Um, C times x, which basically means C1x1 plus C2x2 plus CKXK, 
subject to um, sort of a system of inequalities and equalities a11 x1 plus a1 k x k less than or equal to mb1 a m1 x1 plus a m k x k less than or equal to mb k um, or equality or greater than or equal to It's okay that I, w I write with this thick pen. I know it sometimes it can get in the way of clarity here, but so what's an example of of, of that? <clears throat> Let me already refer to. Um, problem that, you know, a part I'm going to assign is homework, but it's the first problem in this uh, chapter 2. I mean, we can start with with uh, examples, but um, let's say maximize 2x1 plus 6x2 subject to minus x1 plus x2 less than or equal than 1, 2x1 plus x2 less than or equal than 2. x1 and x2 are positive. Number 2. Number 2. It's number two. So, is this a, an, a linear programming problem? It is. We have an objective function that's linear. We have two, two constraints that are linear. In fact, we already have four constraints, right? And you can see that the first two are like less than or equal to, and the last two are um, greater than or equal to. But they're all, all of them are linear. Right? Now we're going to give a special kind of consideration to these constraints where many of the times the variables that we kind of consider or the problems we consider are we want only positive uh, values for the variable. So, so that's why we really kind of, we can say we have two constraints, two inequality constraints, and we have the um, requirement that the feasible set has to be, you know, has to have positive components. Okay? <coughs> so let's see, how do we, um, how do we kind of think of this? I mean, you've have, has anybody seen this? Have, has anybody not seen such a problem, solving such a problem? With two variables, um, you can even do it in a, in a graphical manner, right? So you can do you can identify the feasible set first. So identify and plot the feasible set. And you can do it because it's have two variables. So it's going to be in the plane, x1 versus x2. Also, as I said, isolating these two constraints, x1 and x2, are positive means you're only looking at that first quadrant. And you're looking at two inequalities to satisfy simultaneously. So one of them is um, actually each inequality is represented on the on the on the plane by what? The if it were equality, it would be represented by a line. 
and since it's an equality, it's one of the half planes, right? So let's first first is to um, plot this line. So let's see. Um, can you do this? Use kind of a we have x1 uh, minus x1 plus x2 equals 1. How do we do this? We how do we plot this? Um, several ways, right? One would be to just say set 1 equal to 0, set x 1 equal to 0 and get x2. That's getting the x-intercepts, right? Um, <clears throat> so I said x, x1 equal 0, x2 is 1. So it's going to be, say, up here, right? And setting x2 equal 0 gives you x1 to be negative 1. So it looks like this is the first line, right? And the second line would be, well, OK, let's do the lines first. 2x1 plus x2 equals to 2. This would be. Yeah, the numbers are given, uh, chosen right uh, easily. So x2 is 0, x1 is 1. And x1 is 0, x2 is 2. Okay. So uh, let me summarize here. So this is. 0, 1, and 80, 1, 0. And this is 1, 0, and 0, 2. Now, we, we still have to figure out the half planes that are uh, corresponding to this, to each inequality. So how do we get the first, for instance? Just check the origin, for instance. So. If the origin satisfies that, it means the origin has to be in that half plane. So exactly. So zero less than one, true. So the for the first line, the half plane is the one below, right? The line below in this picture. And for <coughs> same same happens for the second line, right? So it means that the feasible set is. This nice bounded region bounded by by this uh, line segments. Of course, there is an intersection point that should be kind of uh, computed, and you can compute by solving the system of the two equations. With the uh, unknowns x1, and x2. Let's, I mean, postpone that until um, we've now concentrated on the objective function. The objective function is to maximize the linear function 2x1 plus 6x2. <coughs> and that's that's a linear function as well. And <coughs> how can we exploit it? This um, this um, property of being linear. What does it maximize that? So basically, it says among all points in this feasible region, I could shade it because it's actually the whole inside and the boundary of that region that's feasible, right? So that's the feasible set. You know, for each point in that region, you know, this objective function has a certain value. Well, what are the values that this function can take in that region? And what's the maximum? And where is that maximum achieved? That's basically the question. Um, of course, if you wouldn't restrict x1 and x2 to a certain boundary region, you could make that function as big as you want, right? 
as small as you want. You can make it zero on a certain on on a on an actual line. So that's sort of, all of those are sort of uh, good good um, kind of uh, easy things to represent in your uh, visually. Uh, for instance, where is this function actually equal to zero? 2x1 plus 6x2 is 0. Origin. Origin and a line that has equation 2x1 plus 6x2 equal to 0. So I lost my. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is identify the. Um, level set, level sets for the objective function, and by level sets we mean where you know pick a pick a constant, pick a number that you want that objective function to achieve. When you set this equal to that, you get a line in this case, right? So, for example, uh, if the constant is zero, means that whatever x two is minus one third x one, for instance, right? So it's a line at with this particular slope going through the origin. And if you were to plot these things, you would see that it gives you already sort of the answer um, by just just plotting the <coughs> the level curves. So if we plot the curve, the level curve that goes through zero, or the zero level set of the objective function, then we get um, this line, a slope negative one third. Well, how do we plot negative one third? Basically, we have to say. Um, sort of in comparison with these other slopes, this particular line has slope negative 2, right? So this is steeper than negative 1 third slope, right? So negative 1 third is a little bit shallower, so it's sort of like not, not may not be very precise, but it's in comparison to the lines that are already drawn, this should be sort of correctly, um, right? So this is the level set where, I'm sorry, not G, but F. The objective function is zero. Now, why is this relevant? Because the objective function being linear, if you change this constant, the you look for a level set where the objective picks value one, then it would be just a translate of this one. Right? So it would be a translate. And um, basically, you don't quite know whether it's translated up or down until you look at the exact uh, objective function. But it's a translate. Um, now, having positive coefficients here, you can also figure out that when you increase this constant, the objective, uh, the value of the obje objective function, you're going kind of this way, right? So in other words, the question basically ends up: how much do you have to translate this level, this level sets through the origin of the objective function, um, and stay relevant to this feasible set, right? Of course, if you translate this this far, and this should be a straight line. Um, and it's not has nothing to do with this objective with this, with this visible set, right? Because it doesn't. I mean, we're only looking for the objective function that takes the values in this visible set. But you can see that actually is, the translate is has to be as far as basically when this line goes to the that vertex, right? So the conclusion is sort of. Uh, immediate yeah. 
I have to get better at this. Um, <coughs> is identify the vertex. Possibly there is there is not only one vertex. It could be several vertices uh, where uh, the translate of the level set leaves, if you want, the um, feasible set. So now it's the time to say, well, it looks like that vertex, which we haven't really computed the values of, the, is the, the, uh, the optimal solution. So then we have to go ahead and, and solve that feasible, uh, that for, you have to find that, uh, co the coordinates of that vertex. And that's going to be the answer. x1 is going to be whatever x1 um, the coordinate of this vertex is, and x2 is going to be whatever you find from, um, so in this case you'd have to solve minus x1 plus x2 equals 1, 2x1 plus x2 equals 2. All right, well, let's, let's just, not too difficult if you, if you subtract, so you get 3x1 equals 1, so you get x1 is a third, and x2 is therefore 4 thirds, right? So the vertex would be one third and four thirds. So this is the optimal solution. Now, what's the optimal maximum um, value of the objective function is going to be two times one third plus six times four thirds. Okay, so that's, this method works beautifully in this example, but it fails miserably. Even if you have three, um, if, you, if you start using three variables, right? Okay. So I'm going to um, just show you before we take a break. Um, I've been looking actually for the optimal kind of visual tool that you can use and I haven't found it. So These are two ones that I found. This is a, uh, a link to an applet that talks about 2D uh, and it graphs everything and it plots everything so it's kind of a nice but it's so limited that I don't even want to spend too much time on it. Um, let's see. So you have, of course, no clue what to, to input. So they have an example here which says maximize, very similar to like one we had there. And you can change those value numbers. Um, well, we can change it now. 2x plus 6y. And they use x and y, not x1 and x2. So subject to minus x plus y less than or equal to 1, whoop, wrong, uh, 1, 2x plus y less than or equal to 2, was it right? And I think we want x positive, uh, greater than or equal to, is this the right way? I don't know. And y positive. Now let's hope it works. Solve. Yeah, it works. Okay. 
So it just kind of computed four vertices, and we've seen the four vertices. Let's graph it so it's, yeah. And it's kind of a small. Oh, it's small because we um, also have limits here. So we said two, maybe, and, and we said three. Um, uh, but anyway, it's it's a very. I don't want to spend too much time. But let's let's uh, let me uh, show you this 3D simplex uh, applet, where you'll um, immediately recognize you know objective function is linear, and they use x y z uh, for the variables, and you have three constraints, and all three constraints look nice and typical. Right, inequality constraints, um, and the x and y and z are positive. That's kind of under, understood in this particular one. So you can actually view the feasible set, and there is actually a. It's not perfect. There's actually one one line missing, so you don't you don't uh, always get the uh, very precise picture. But um, you can see the feasible set now is, is consists of this um, <clears throat> polyhedra, right? That has a lot more faces that you would have guessed, I think. Um, and why is that? Well, well, I guess faces is kind of e easier to uh, identify, but the vertices are, are uh, number of vertices is something difficult to uh, count un un unless you plot these things. Okay, So what's happening with each inequality? You now have a plane in 3D that separates two uh, half spaces. Okay, So you have basically three planes and one half space for each of those planes, the intersection of all of those in the first octant is what you see here. Okay. And it's already hard to see. Um, okay, nevertheless, the question is the same. How do you find um, a maximum? I think that's self well, there's an issue even with, you know, do we look for maximum or do we look for minimum? Right? But in this case, I think they look for a maximum of that expression on this, what's, you know, it's called a simplex. <coughs> well, the idea is pretty much the same um, as before, where you have the level sets for this Objective function are no longer lines, but they are. When you have a, a, a function that has x, y, and z, a linear in x, y, and z, equals 0, for instance. That's the plane going through the origin, right? And, you know, in 3D, you can have many orientations of that plane. In fact, there's a normal to that plane, if you remember from, from your multivariable calculus, that you just pick the coefficients of those linear of the linear uh, expression uh, so 20 12 and 18 and that vector is point is is what normal to the plane okay it's exactly the normal to the plane so the fact that you have all positive values means that the normal points you know we're we're sitting in the first octant here so the points in the towards us so it means the plane is sort of pretty much, we're looking at the whole plane. I mean, in other words, it's not tilted towards us. It's more like towards us. Um, it's is more like we're facing the plane. So it looks like that um, level set for the objective function is first, like if we think of it as translating, because in the end, when we change the, value for the objective function, we're just translating that plane in the direction of the normal. So we can see that if we slide that plane in the direction of the normal, 
The first time it touches uh, is the origin. First time it touches this this uh, simplex, this uh, polyhedron, is the origin. So the first, of course, there is no way to plot that plane really, but in this applet, that's the first. Um, okay, and I think not that it has anything to do with it, but I think the first the first one is the yeah the origin, right? So that's going to be a minimum value for this objective function. Okay. Now we're going to actually um, look for the maximum value of the objective function, meaning we're going to have to translate it until it leaves that region. And depending on how the, how the normal to that plane is compared to all these faces, you could get, you know, you could get, uh, you certainly were going to get a, a, a vertex but you may actually get a, a whole edge of this simplex, right? It might actually be the, the first, the, the last time it, me, it meets this simplex, it may be when it, it kind of touches this whole line, right? So in that case, we wouldn't have a unique optimal solution. We would have several uh, opt infinitely many optimal solutions. But if it's, if it's the right kind of, you know, sort of generic position, then you would get one vertex. In this case, I think uh, this computation shows is this vertex. Okay. How do you figure all those out? I mean, that's already kind of a complicated um, exercise. Now, you've seen that uh, simplex tableaus. So let me just kind of put it up on the. If you've seen those, I mean, you might have seen them, you know, I've forgotten about, I mean, that's, um, the strategy is to actually make it into a procedure that you don't have to even think about. You just kind of automatically, and, and in the end, make a computer do it for you, right? Uh, where you create this kind of a system, systematic table or tableau, I mean, that's French, right? Um, And then you operate on this tableau. I mean, you exploit it to your advantage, and to conclude, you know, what's the last, what's the optimal uh, vertex, what's a optimal vertex where this happens. Okay. So uh, after the break, well, um, I'll sort of describe how this is done. Hopefully, you've seen it at some point, um, and. Then we'll go to, into kind of the reason why they, why you operate on this tableau the same way we do, um, and kind of give you a geometric explanation. And the, this book is actually very good at synthesizing that, you know, the theory behind this uh, simplex method. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, it's in the resources. Part of the, there's going to be a, the course is going to have, well, I'll show you again.